what was it like going from your small town in the Caucasus to Moscow, like a huge sprawling city? Was that crazy? I loved it. The minute I landed into the big city, I still remember that I, 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 I went there by a bus. It's like <laughs> 20 hours something bus. I have uh, a bag, not a suitcase. And I, I get out of this bag. I look at this big city and like, I love it. Finally, there's <laughs> some things to do here. It's going to be fun. Hey there, good people in crypto land. I'm Matt Lysing. This is my podcast, Decent People. Welcome to the conversation. If you've been following the NFT marketplace for any time, you know that there's been ups and downs. And more recently, there's been some controversy uh, with certain platforms that have been toying around with the uh, idea of what creators of NFTs get in terms of royalties. This was one of the coolest things um, about NFTs when they came out, in my opinion, was for the first time an artist, say a photographer or a digital artist like Beeple, could earn royalties on their NFTs as they sold throughout their lifetime, as opposed to traditional artists who, you know, can sell an early painting for maybe a couple hundred dollars and that painting could go on to be worth millions, but the artist doesn't get a cut of any of those secondary sales. So NFTs, because they're based on smart contracts, had this option to uh, make sure that the artist, uh, the creator, got a certain percentage, maybe five or 10% of all secondary sales. Um, I always thought that was one of the, the greatest innovations um, in NFTs and really kind of put the balance back in favor of the artist here uh, rather than collectors or, you know, maybe art speculators. Not that speculation is bad, but I just never thought it was quite fair that an artist didn't get to, to reap some of the rewards when their works um, went on to be very valuable. Today, we have on the show um, Alex Salnikov. He's the co-founder and chief creative officer at Rarible, which is one of the bigger NFT platforms. And we talk about NFTs and we talk about his, his past and everything. And he illuminated for me something that I didn't know, which was that there is a conflict between the smart contracts that are used to operate on the one hand, the NFT that the artist creates. And then on the other hand, the uh, smart contracts that run a platform like Rarible or OpenSea, those are not the same. And so I'm going to leave it to Alex to explain it much better than I just did. But I thought that was a very interesting um, point and something that I learned about in this conversation. We talk a lot about NFTs and how he uh, got into crypto. I hope you guys enjoy the show and thanks for uh, all the support. Hey, Alex. So where am I talking to you today from? Hey, Matt. Uh, I'm in our office in Williamsburg, New York now. Yeah. Uh, that's really funny because we just had a story come out today uh, about Williamsburg being like the central uh, spot for crypto in New York City. Um, so it's great to talk to somebody from uh, right uh, at, at the epicenter. I can I can definitely confirm our place here. Um, it's 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 called the Brass Factory. It's like a community of Web three startups. Uh, we're all here together. There's multiple. Well, before we get into Rarible and, and NFT world, um, I'd love to just, you know, talk to you about your past and, and your background and, and where you came from. Um, so where were you born? I was born in a very small town in Russia, in the in the thousand part uh, where the Caucasian mountains are. Maybe maybe you heard about Sochi. So that's like 100 kilometers okay. uh, from from that. Right, that's where the Winter Olympics were a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it became yeah. much better yeah. after Winter Olympics. Yeah, cool. Um, and uh, did, did you have brothers and sisters growing up? I did, I did. That's a fairly large family. I have um, two brothers and, and, and one sister, so four people. Okay. And did they go into tech as well, like you did? Uh, my, my older brother is in tech. Yes, uh, he's a front end engineer, and my my younger brother and sister they're they're still in their school, but my, my okay. brother he's like aware about, about crypto. He trades crypto. Uh, yeah. So does he give you uh, like late night texts about what I what should I do? Should I buy Solana or should I sell Solana? That kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. He he recently yeah. asked me about <laughs> if I heard about Mastodon, and what I think about it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then, so your, your younger brother and sister are still in school. Are they a lot younger than you are? My, my younger sister, she's 20 years difference with me. So 
that that's oh, wow. all the difference oh yeah was there a little mistake there on your parents part <laughs> that was very deliberate when we went to the college they yeah they said well um we were we're bored Let, let's have more Those oh really cool. <laughs> oh wow that's uh i, I could th think of other things to do if i was bored than than have another baby <laughs> um what did uh, speaking of your parents what did they do while you were growing up my mother she's like medical practitioner and my father is doing construction so not much okay. tech related stuff but okay. i think my background is heavily influenced my grand parents my 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 grandmother and my grandfather uh my grandmother was the elementary school teacher i i studied at her class actually and and my oh, grandfather really? he is the mathematics teacher uh, uh -huh. and we were doing like olympics uh like olympic style unusual math uh tasks when i was young i think that 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 helped me a lot oh cool um I got to ask if your grandmother was your kindergarten teacher, was she easy on you or like extra hard on you? Because I think it's going to be one or the other, right? Extra hard on me. I had an idea that that's where that would go. Um, and then with your grandfather, did you um, kind of have a natural proclivity to math? Was it something that came easy to you or, or how did that work? It's, it's actually unclear. Uh, I remember that I was even a little forced to do that. But when I asked uh my my parents my grandparents they say oh you were so curious like you liked yeah. that it, it was easy for you you you, you was into that so i don't know they, nobody knows the truth now <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's funny because um, my older son will do math problems for fun like he'll look up hard um you know things that aren't solvable yet or so, whatever and he'll just kind of chew on them and it's really interesting because I'm cert I was certainly never that way, but um, he really likes it. So, um, and then what? So, what was the name of the town you grew up in? And like, what uh, you said, it was a very small place. What was that like? Was it was it like rural and nice and you know, kind of calm and peaceful and everything like that? Or what, what was the surroundings like? It's rural. Like maybe there was below five buildings, uh, higher than two stories uh very very flat uh, rural most of the people there are into agriculture because there's like a good soil you can literally like feed yourself out of your backyard and you can sell that so that's what most of the people done for me rather than nice and nature it was like completely boring and and and, and that, <laughs> that that's how i felt it growing up like, uh, that, that's oh, what i was gonna why ask. are you well, yeah. Yeah, I was going to ask you, you either probably loved it or you thought it was completely boring, right? Yeah, yeah, that's that's de definitely the second. Yeah, okay. Um, and then, um, so did you like school? Were you were you good in school? Like, what, what was that like for you? I think I liked school. Uh, I was definitely good at it. Uh, I finished with, like, a golden medal, you say, so more or less uh, excellent marks for all the um all the different subjects i loved it i loved uh, precise subjects mostly mm -hmm. but i was good in literature and languages too uh, yeah probably it's all it's all heavily influenced by that's the most interesting things to do to 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 keep your brain busy when there's nothing to do yeah. study right. right did you gravitate to computers um so in, you were born in 94 so they would have been, you know, uh, was that something that was like in your life in that point? Or did you have to go to school like to kind of get exposed to like computer science and things like that? Uh, I've got my computer at fifth grade uh, in school. So right after the elementary. Okay. And okay. that was maybe the second person in the class that got a PC. That was fairly early. Uh, big thanks to my parents. They thought that this is the future and that we absolutely have to have it. And mm -hmm. it, it wasn't even something heavily affordable at us. We, my parents had to take a loan to get a computer, but that was probably the best decision uh, for for our future. Yeah, that's cool. Um, and they got it in like 
to give to you or because they thought it was just the future and they needed to have it in general? Or did they see something in you that, that they wanted to encourage? For sure, that was me and my older brother. Uh, he is just one and a half year older than me, so we were always were on par and everything. And they thought, they're, they're not into computers, they thought that we should have it as, as people that, that grow up. Um, like a year after we got connected to the internet and that was, wow. What was it about like computers and the internet that, that really appealed to you? It's a good question. I think just, just all, all the same ideas about being bored of having almost zero inputs. And now mm. there was like massive amounts of inputs, new information. The internet connection was very slow. I still remember, you know, this like it's a dial up modem. Yeah, which makes yeah, yeah. these weird sounds when, when when it's connecting. Yeah, fifty-six yeah. kilobytes. Let's, let's do that for this person. It was like <laughs> something like that. Something like that. It uh, if you've heard it, you, you did it. 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 Nailed it. Yeah, nailed it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I remember those days well. Um, and so yeah, that must have been really fun, and and it opened up a whole new world for you, right? Because you could sort of. At that time, I remember you could sort of be anonymous, you know, you could go into chat groups or, you know, you could talk um, with people from anywhere around the world and they wouldn't know that you were a young kid in Russia, right? Absolutely. I think more, for, for the beginning, most of the part that was playing games, of course, mm -hmm. but yeah. that makes you, that makes you like agile. Uh, it, it, it develops your, your skills of being like snap and making decisions. Um, it develops your skills of using keyboard, mouse. And then I dive this wormhole of, of even Wikipedia. Oh, here's an article about something in the world. Oh, okay, here's a reference. Let's read the reference. So I could, I could spend a lot of time just like jumping around references and, and looking, reading text, all that things. Yeah. And at some point we started to, you know, uh, there was a concept of you need to crack the game to play it because it wasn't, uh, it wasn't licensed and licensed and distributed. So you needed to like add some and some files to, to, to the game. Um, okay. And then that cracked the windows and I needed to reinstall that. So you were breaking stuff, but then fixing it. And like, that was that sort of your entree into coding and, and getting kind of into the weeds of, of the computer world? Mm -hmm. not, not into coding, probably more like into the like no code stuff, because I always felt like, oh, coding is too hard. I would never be able to do that. Uh, mm -hmm. Although like I, I learned how to do that later in the university, but I felt like I, I can combine different like scripts together um yeah like adding adding a, a, a js script to html file was was my, my my top at this point are you do you think computers or something in that field is kind of where you're heading and, and are you like kind of did it or when did it dawn on you that you wanted to kind of like you know be in computer science or, or make that your career i can say that that's probably was never a choice because um, my, my father has two brothers and they grew up and they went to Moscow State University, which is a, the, the math and physics, uh, faculty and their yeah. wives went to the math and physics departments and their kids were there. So that's, that's the family thing. I was, I was, I felt like this is the nice track that you do. You grew up in a, mm. in a village, you study well. You go to Moscow to study in the big university, and then you have a job that that is, I don't know, pays you 10x of what you can get in the, in the village. So, yeah. Well, that's curious. Let me ask you: Did your dad just not want to do that? Because you said he was in construction. So did he? Was he sort of like you know said, "No, nah, that's not for me." That's exactly what happened. He yeah. used that track as well. He went to Moscow. Uh, after school and he taken a look at that and he said, well, I don't like that. It's too noisy. It's too busy. I want to get back to the nature. I want to take care of the family. I want to take care of my grand, of, of his parents, my grandparents. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and he was more or less like this. That's actually a tradition in, um, uh, there's like Caucasus families, 
where the younger brother is always uh, like has to take care of of the parents that his job okay and your dad's the younger yeah my dad's the younger so for you that you were uh, it sounds like you were kind of waiting to get out there and see the world a little bit more exactly and and i, I was pushed to my, my parents always told me like yeah here is nothing here just go out <laughs> uh, encourage you like study well we won't be able to pay for your education so study on your own and just like get as far out of here as possible so uh, tell us how did how did you do that did you go to moscow or wh what was the what was the path from the rural caucuses out to the, the wider world i need to give credit to the education system in russia it is completely free 70 percent of people get world-class education for free um you at the end of the school you take the unified exam everywhere across the whole country um it's something like this uh, uh was gmat or here yeah but it, it's not it's not direct alternative but like every it, it's mandatory for every person after school take exam and then all universities have the same uh agenda they all accept people ranking ranked by this exam and i was i, I didn't expect that i thought that my my future will be will be less bright but i've got uh, quite good of of the marks i've got the maximum 100 out of 100 uh on physics uh and like only 40 people in that year in the whole country got this 100 out of 100. wow that's, that's impressive. fairly fairly rare and uh my, my parents were reckless enough to uh, give birth to me uh, while the um, situation in the country was was not great and that's what there was like a demographic uh cave and i had much less of a competition of getting to the universities than even five years later yeah i hadn't thought of that so this would have been right around when yeltsin was president or no yeah that's way... three years after collapse when you were yeah when you were born right 91 was yeah. and then okay right um yeah so so the demographics were in your favor that's pretty cool um you, you say that you uh you didn't expect it and and it, it sounds like your your other comments you've made you're rather um kind of self-deprecating do you do you uh where does that come from do you, you, you you've done really well for yourself but you seem very humble uh which i appreciate i like humble people but i'm just curious is was it your older brother always like being like bearing down on you or something or, or what uh where do you think that comes from for some reason i i was aware that where i grew up in in that small village that i was like uh good in terms of like marks exams all that but i always imagined the other world to be that bright place where everyone is smart so yeah of course here is like i can i can do better than others but i felt like once i go to the big world that that won't be ever the case um and that i need to like keep up keep up with myself to to be uh, to be competitive uh, i felt like my parents were more or less struggling uh in in general in that environment and i thought that you know this is how how life looks like you you have to grind your way through it, everything is difficult you, you you have to be really good at, at everything to, to to be able to um, to succeed um you have to study hard you, do, you have to do everything in a hard way to to get somewhere yeah yeah totally um and so i'm curious once you made your way out into the wider world how did you feel like you stacked up against competition uh first couple of weeks in university i i thought that's like a disaster uh i don't <laughs> understand anything this there's uh advanced math and that i wasn't prepared for and some of the other people they went to the school with more like advanced math that was preparing them for university i was like oh sh shit uh that's that's not great mm, but a couple of weeks into it uh i've got a little better and my my older brother helped me he, he went to the same university a couple of years before he helped me too and then i remember uh the first exam session 
uh, in a half a year, first semester, I realized that a third of the people got like um, uh, dispelled, got uh, expelled from from university oh, really? uh, because because they didn't meet it. Oh, yeah, they failed their exams and got kicked out. Yeah, they got kicked out, and I was all right. It feels like I'm doing even better than them. That's <laughs> that's surprising too. Yeah. Okay, I I can do it. And so now you're in Moscow, right? Yeah, at this point I'm in yeah. Moscow. I'm 16, 17, so that's 2010. What was it like going from your small town in the Caucasus to Moscow, like a huge sprawling city? Was that crazy? I loved it. The minute I landed into the big city, uh, I I still remember that I I I I went there by a bus. It's like <laughs> 20 hours something a bus. Uh, that is special. People go to to the big market to Moscow to buy things to sell them uh, on the retail, and so you can actually like sleep and lay in that bus. It's not it's not a sitting bus. It's a sleeping bus. Um, yeah, I, I have a, a bag, not a suitcase, and I, I get out of this bag. I look at this big city and like, I love it. Finally, there's <laughs> some things to do here. It's gonna be fun. Was it? Um, did you travel on the plots cart? That does ring a bell. Uh, not not by that time. Maybe a little okay. later. Uh, but that that's a famous thing. The 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 cheapest uh, couch. Yeah, I traveled through Eastern Russia or Eastern Europe and Russia uh, back in like two thousand three, two thousand four. And my wife and I, we we just didn't have a lot of money, and so the plots cart is like it's almost less than third class, right? It's kind of just like. It's like the cheapest way you can go is what I recall. Is that is that right? That's right. That's uh, that's sort of an equivalent of third class. It's it's regular class uh, here. Like like seventy percent of the uh, of the train is plus carded, but it's famous for uh, for being like even less than third class because of the you know, yeah. culture. It's all all sorts of people doing all sorts of crazy stuff. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, we, we would take them overnight and I would just sort of like clutch my bags the whole time because <laughs> I was worried somebody would try to take our stuff. Um, okay, so you were like at 2010-ish. Have you come across Bitcoin at all yet? Or when did you first cross paths with like crypto? My first path across crypto was my second year university. Um, or even the first one, actually the first one, uh, a second year I started to already like working in crypto. It was, it was the yeah. first project, but first year, uh, I would, I, I had some, some creativity to come off from me. I did a small viral project. Have you seen the social movie, uh, social network movie? Yeah. Yeah. The about one about Zuckerberg. Facebook. And yeah, yeah, and yeah, the, the Winkle, Winklevoss twins and all that stuff. Yeah, sure. One of his first project was like face mesh, uh, uh -huh. like some girls competition when you need to click left or right. Yeah, I found out online the script for for the same uh, for the same website. I, I scanned through our university catalog and filled that up with like five thousand pictures, and that that blew up. <laughs> went really viral okay. that's how i met my yeah. my partner my first business partner oh really yeah i remember w here in the states there was one called hot or not and you would swipe you know left or right to judge whatever person you were looking at if you thought they were attractive or not and then they'd have like a score so it's kind of like that right exactly yeah. same. exact same script somebody yeah. created that after a movie and then so what's the connection there to crypto did that went viral uh across our university and my, my my business partner with whom we spent multiple years doing startups after he reached out to me and say like oh, you seem like you're a witty guy uh let's maybe do something together and he introduced me to crypto uh, i started to read up about it and we decided that we will make an exchange because there are some other guys that made an exchange and earned like a million dollar and that's a holy grail of of um, of uh, young people dreaming about big yeah. stuff, like oh, we're going Absolutely. to do the same, and we're gonna earn a million dollar. 
very smart too to want to make an exchange because the exchange always makes money, right? It doesn't matter really uh, if if prices are going up or down necessarily. Uh, the, the exchange is always going to take a little cut there of every trade. Um, so I'm guessing it didn't work out with the exchange. Uh, it, it didn't. Well, for some for some part it did, but not. We, we didn't earn a million dollar. Yeah, we, we we learned how to how to do projects more or less. Yeah. Uh, I was I was coding it myself, the back end part of that, and we were doing it locally in Russia, and it was supposed to facilitate just exchanges, flat rate, not something order book based or something. Uh, and at some point, the central bank issued a decree that well. It's not really cool to work with crypto, and we recommend you to abstain from that. And not not to us, but to the payment system that we worked with to facilitate these transactions. Yeah, and and that more or less killed the project. Mm. In the same time, it pushed us to go global because it was clear that oh, and the the regulation here is is an obstacle. Yeah, what do you? I mean, I'm curious on your perspective as a Russian, like what. What is it in the Russian government's view that they that they don't like crypto? Because I think they've kind of come and gone, like they've had somewhat conflicting um, opinions on this uh, over the years. But what do you think it was initially that they didn't like about it? I think in general, there is a lot of capital controls because the economy, the Soviet economy, and after that, Russian economy inherited that idea that the open flow of capital is not a good thing because if you allow that, then the capital will just like flew out of the country. Mm, right. And because of that, and, and a very open nature of crypto was was kind of alarming that, oh, if if you took a bribe and then you want to get that capital out of the country, that's that's very easy to, to do with, with crypto. Yeah, it's a threat basically, right, to their system. Um, okay, so, did you and then so you said that this sort of opened up your eyes to wanting to be global um is that something that um now are you thinking okay well it's time to leave moscow and go somewhere else or what's what's the thinking like there at this point mm, the thinking is more like not that i need to live per se but i would just target the projects to to be global it doesn't matter okay. where i am more or less, but I can tar I can do them in English. I can target the global audience, and I I I basically want to want to work uh, like outside. It's not like you want to go to London or New York City. It's more that you just want to expand the the horizon of of who you're reaching with the projects you're you're working on. Yeah, it it felt like internet finally enabled us. We don't really care where we live. We can mm -hmm. we can be global uh, from from any place, and that was the dream. Mm, so you you only need to do the like digital like, like you need to have a legal entity outside uh, in in somewhere in the global world, and then uh, resource wise, uh, Russia is great. There is a lot of engineers, there is a lot of designers. Great technical school, great uh, visual school, uh, best. Uh, best in in the world i would say so from the exchange that didn't work out then uh are, we're getting close to maybe when ethereum was coming out and did that change your view of like blockchain and what what could be possible i mean obviously we'll get to rareable and nfts which wouldn't be possible without something like like ethereum or smart contracts but w was that sort of the next step in the evolution for you the next step was like a centralized exchange. So the first one was like flat rate, like, oh, it's, it's like cashier, like an on-ramp rather than exchange event. I see, you still wanted to make your million dollars, right? Yeah, yeah. You were still, yeah, yeah, <laughs> obviously, <All> right? <laughs> Sorry to interrupt, obviously. but go ahead. <laughs> I thought, okay, uh, let's do the order book based exchange. And yeah. the problem of all existing exchanges is that they're slow. So let's make a fast exchange. I think many people in crypto thought that oh, that's, that's the actual issue. Everything is slow. There was a lot of Ethereum killers uh, that thought that the only problem is scalability. So we've built up amazing matching engines supporting short sales and leverage a million trades per second in memory execution. 
and like zero liquidity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the most important part. The most important part. <laughs> okay. So how does the centralized exchange work? Do you, do you guys, did you make, uh, did, did it work out this time? No, that didn't work <laughs> out. That was, that was 2014, uh, 15 times. Um, okay. It's still mostly learning. Oh, you need to hire some people. Uh, you need to, to make the design. You need to do the product. You need to combine all that hundred features into something that can look okay. Um, you need to do regulatory work, you need to open a bank account, you need to open a company, you need to do compliance, it's hard. So uh, all that foundational stuff was, was really helpful. Yeah, I'm right there with you. I, I started my own media company uh, a couple of years, like a year and a half ago, and just going through all that stuff, uh, it's, it's daunting, and I had no idea how uh, time-consuming it can be. Um, okay, so then, um, let's jump forward to like how did um how did you get like what do you remember your first experience with nfts or when you first learned about you know something digitally that, that or a digital item that could be scarce i guess there we went to ethereum and i i i clearly remember at some point this whole new concept of smart contracts was mm -hmm. very unclear to me how can the program can be executed in the cloud i i didn't understand what are the limitations what can be executed what cannot be i mostly knew crypto and i remember that i was going around i was asking people like oh what, what should i read which book can you recommend me something on smart contracts and nobody was able to tell me something somebody said oh just hire me instead like i know all about that I was like, okay <laughs> smart uh, smart I mean, there weren't really many books back then, were there? I mean, you could like read the Ethereum no. white paper, um, but yeah, there was not a lot out there. That's that's exactly what I did. I, re I read the Ethereum yeah. white paper and that was super clear. Vitalik did great job on writing that down with, with his friends. I was like, okay, that was that was like on the surface. Uh, I think the main jump was that, oh, if the program is deterministic, if anybody executes it and gets the same result, then we could we can put that on the blockchain mm -hmm. so that was that was a click i understood okay now the smart contracts tokens all that we we'll ride the wave of 2017 on the mm -hmm. uh, helping other companies to launch their like icos uh that was that was rewarding uh, we didn't want to launch ours because it's like it's a big commitment uh and it, it didn't feel i didn't feel ready back then mm -hmm. and and then after 2017, there was so much noise. I, I barely kept tracking the, the media because it, it, there was a lot of false, false narratives, a lot of noise, a lot of things that are not true, that aren't working. And then 2018, crypto winter, everything's quiet. And like, like now, but now it's much more noisy, but quiet, very quiet. And I found out about, about GFI about in 2017 you needed to download mist and wait for the network to synchronize like 200 gigabytes of data and then to add yeah. smart contract inside your uh your your wallet uh past the abi and then call the function to participate in the crowd sale and that was hard and 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 just a year or a couple of years later i'm seeing metamask you can connect your to to a website you can you can use on ramp wire to to buy some 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 stuff and you can you can take a loan it's a collateral so all, all this vibrant ecosystem and every wallet has a collectible step that is empty there's no collectibles and then then crypto kitties of course when everyone was able to interact with digital items and then there was a bunch of crypto kitties clones like exactly the same um but the crypto kid just explained the concept real well. It's 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 it, the cat has a DNA. It's almost a living creature on the blockchain. Right. It, it's funny how how far back we went from that vision to an actual like oh it's just a blunt picture. Yeah, I mean people and, make fun of like it's just a picture of an ape, right? <laughs> but it it all started with a picture of a cat. But you could, <laughs> I remember people making fun of crypto kitties a lot. They just thought it was like some joke, but. Uh, it was cool that 
the, the, this was actually, you know, here's a digital item that is actually collectible and scarce for the first time. And that's because of the blockchain, which I don't think a lot of people understood. You, you can breed them. They, they have DNA. When you breed them, they exchange DNAs. Yeah. It's like Tamagotchi. Yeah, right. Pokemon. Um, and so, that, so okay, that, that all opened your eyes and you understood now that smart contracts were deterministic and, and the call function and all of that uh, is, is key. Um, when, did, when did you get involved with Rarible? Like, was this, were there a couple steps in the, in the process here? Or are you getting close to joining them? Um, how did that all work? Yes, 2018, that was a crypto winter. We're getting closer because Rarible started 2019. Uh, mm -hmm. that also was my sabbatical year when, when I was doing not much, keeping my, my body healthy. Uh, I decided that I'll, uh, I'll de deplete myself from dopamine, like no, no movies. Uh, I stopped smoking. Uh, I, I was a heavy tobacco smoker. I was playing a lot of mm -hmm. computer games. I decided to drop all that and be like the sports and uh, the hardest, the, the easiest way to get content for me allowed from a loud list was, was reading a book or, or reading mm -hmm. something in regards to work because I felt like I'm lazy, you know, like I, I, uh, all my life, I felt that I'm a lazy person. Um, <laughs> and I said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to push myself. I'm, I'm going to train my will and I'm going to like for, forbid myself to do any easy thing to get the gratification. And, and that paid out so well. Uh, I, I got so bored. I, I finished I finished the master's. I got my driver's license. I got the uh, US visa and, and I went to US just because I had nothing to do. <laughs> Back then, I, 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 st I was researching all that space uh, mm -hmm. about about crypto and I was shooting everything interested that, that I found to, to my network, like people who are into, into crypto too. Um, some, some guys from Zerion, uh, and, and Alexei, who is now the, uh, like we started the rare together. Uh, he was receptive to that. So when more or less I would, I was sending articles and they, and they were tanking at everybody and he was answering me something. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, that's, mm -hmm. that's something, uh, uh, there was some discussion about it. And at some point he organized a group of people, uh, he, like that was a Saturday. And he said, he called me and he said, oh, come over. We are here at the cafe, just like thinking about brainstorming. What, what can we do? And I came over and and exactly in that cafe the wearable was born we thought well what 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 can we do some yeah. somebody talked about nfts yeah and that's how it all started well it's interesting i'm i'm now just putting together what you were trying to do previously with you know the exchanges that you tried to start um and here you go here you are wearable is basically an exchange right if it's a marketplace it's and and so i guess i would say third time is the charm for you it, it wasn't even the third. I, th there was multiple of uh, different dead stuff in the process. Uh, I, at once I calculated that there was 10 projects that died at different stages, but usually you have a branding, you have a deck, you have a logo, mm -hmm. you have an idea, you start to work on it, and maybe like it, maybe you don't raise funding or something. They all died at different stages. So that's more or less yeah. like 10th. So that's a good thing for listeners to, to understand, you know, you gotta, you gotta be willing to fail 10 times to, to, to succeed or, or more. Right. I, I was just, just, just so interested. I wasn't ready to stop. Yeah. Yeah. That's also the passion is, is key. Um, so what, um, what do you think is going on now in the NFT world? Obviously we've talked about the crypto winter prices have come down a lot. Interest is sort of waning. Uh, and then, I'd love to hear your views on what's going on with some platforms that are uh, sort of, uh, you know, the, the thing I thought that was really great for artists in, in the NFT world was that the royalties were kind of baked in to the code, right? And you would have royalties on an initial sale, but then you'd also have royalties on secondary sales, which artists in the real world, you know, never get. 
once you sell your painting and it gets sold on, that's, you know, you don't get any cut. So I, I thought, I always thought that was a fascinating part of the NFT world, but some platforms out there now, like OpenSea flirted with changing the way that it's, uh, it pays artists um, royalties. Um, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on that and what, what you guys think at Rarible about that. I feel like this, all this royalties is um, a big on um it, just a big unfortunate coincidence the fact that royalties could not be enforced on chain just the way the network works the smart contract of nft and smart contract of marketplace it's two different smart contracts and smart contract of nft which regulates the actual transfer uh doesn't even know that oh that was a that was a sale it's just a transfer for it you you, you can transfer it from from a, from your wallet to another your wallet and obviously you don't want to pay royalties when you transfer that from one wallet to another and yeah. when you're making a sale it's really hard to tell oh well was that a sale or that was just a transfer so more or less it's the choice of the marketplace to pay the royalties or not to pay royalties and there was some marketplace that that didn't pay royalties and that surprisingly got uh, not because they didn't want to but just because they didn't implement that feature yet it's it's, it's hard you still you need to prioritize what you're developing and 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 they they deprioritized that feature to pay royalties and they've got a substantial market share and and now it's like uh it's the game theory somebody's not paying <laughs> Well, how does that work? Because I guess I don't understand it because I thought because it's a smart contract um, that, that is controlling the NFT that, that you could program in to make sure that a part of all future sales went to the creator. Is that, am I wrong about that or am I miss, missing something there? The thing is that uh, NFT smart contract is basically, it's, it's very simple. It basically says the owner wallet 0x123 owns an item number 500 and there is a transfer function that takes where we transfer from to where we transfer to and i can say okay just transfer this num item number 500 to the new owner 0x124 not 123 and, and because of the like composability that's basically the only thing that the NFT contract knows and sees. It's composable, it's abstracted away. It, it, it has this internal storage and outside there is only one function transfer. Yeah. So when you sell an item on Rarible or any other marketplace, this marketplace is given the permission to transfer that on your behalf. And whenever you sell it, it just calls this transfer function and this transfer happens. And the smart contract of NFT doesn't know what was it a sale or was it just a transfer from uh, your wallet to another wallet. So there is no such like enforceability. You can't you can't create the the code that oh only transfer that if there was royalties paid because you don't know that there was a sale. You don't know the price. You don't know how much needed to be paid. The only thing you can do is you can basically say, oh, if that is transfer from Blur, then just don't don't make that transfer. So you can you can block certain uh, marketplaces from from being able to sell your item, but you can't block them on on the intellectual basis that oh that was a sale with royalties or that was a sale without royalties. Yeah, so that makes sense to me that you wouldn't want to pay royalties on a transfer, but. How, just the last thing here, like how, um, if I'm an artist and I have sold my NFTs, like where does that come in? H or how does it come in so that I do get royalties on a secondary sale down the line? What was that? What my question, I guess, is like, you know, what has to happen for that to happen? It's a social contract. It is basically the feature of marketplaces that pays out royalties. Uh, okay. The feature of Rarible. You can go to Rarible, you can click, that's my contract. You can click settings, set up royalties, 5%. And every sale would, would send a 5% to you. 
the same with open sea code you can go there and you can set up royalties there so you need to go to the marketplace and you need to find out how this specific marketplace treats royalties and you can okay. uh set this up to your wallet there is a royalty registry um it's like cross marketplace smart contract uh from manifold that you can set up your uh, royalties at and some marketplaces will pick that up but it's again a it's a choice of marketplace okay yeah that makes sense to me so the royalty function is a marketplace function it's not embedded in the nft itself not yet there is uh we, we caught up with some open c people and there are some updates that need to be done into the network itself ethereum network and then you would be able to incorporate that function into the nft itself oh, okay cool is that upgrade coming in any of the stuff they're doing this year uh with with the uh was it a shanghai or i can't remember what the new version's yeah. going to be i might be mistaken but i think it's the proto dank sharding that needs to be done oh, uh gosh. it it's it, i think it's coming this year what's your outlook on the general nft market in general now are you um obviously the prices go up and they go down uh but are you getting wind of like cool projects or or maybe more uses for your nfts um i know utility is something that i've talked to with a few people about nfts um because i think everyone realizes there's a lot of potential here but it hasn't really been tapped as much as it as it could be yet i think we had 2017 moment in the nft market when there yeah, was a sure. lot of projects that said oh we're going to x and and there is basically a lot of projects that aren't doing nothing and not not even projects but nfts that that don't yet have the functionality uh that that is intended and crypto art spiked because it is kind of an NFT that doesn't need a functionality, and that was why it's found the product market fit. The second one was PFP, because the only functionality it needs is, oh, put the, it on the avatar and enter a closed Discord with that one, a gated Discord. Right. Um, and, and we're seeing more and more depth to, to the NFT. There is a project funded by 16Z, which is called Story Protocol, which combines multiple NFTs into narratives. And there is Doodles 2, which would allow you to duplicate your NFT parts and assemble the new avatar with wearables that are taken from the boxes that are in NFT as well. Mm -hmm. So an NFT is a standard, it's a shell. It's, it's, a, it's a way to to take an item and, and send it to somewhere else but an actual mm -hmm. item is extendable it, it has a depth like a like a like a, you know, like a ship uh, or like an iceberg that that that, that has the, the the backwater thing and and this 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 is growing and there is more and more potential uh there is potential you can you can vote with your nft in the dao uh we will see for sure some Metaverse games where NFTs are wearable. You can use your 3D avatar clone X in a game. Uh, you can use Nike shoes. So mm -hmm. we're, it's it's the general this like road to the metaverse, which is the yeah. digital alternative to the to the world we are in. But in the world we are in, there is a lot of physics. The items can interact with each other, and in the metaverse they cannot yet. So. Uh, long-term very, very bullish on, on, on that kind of... I have been living in Metaverse since my fifth grade, right? This <laughs> yeah. Very bullish on that long-term. And we are in this depth, the, this this bear market, the, exactly is the last one during which there was all sorts of infrastructure built, all sorts of cool stuff built. There's going to be a lot of things built this bear market and we're going to expand on that next bull. Yeah, that's really cool because I think digital wearables are going to be huge, and I, I hadn't really thought about them as NFTs, but that's basically what they are. But I think NFT is also, in this context, not the right 
so it, it brings up a certain idea in my head that isn't quite the same thing that we're talking about uh, in the future, I think, because what, like you said, if it's a pair of Nike shoes that I'm wearing on my avatar in the metaverse, then of course I could sell those to somebody else. And that's basically just like an NFT sale. Right. But it's, it's also it's something that is, is a part of my avatar. And so it's, it's, yeah. So it, I'm just trying to wrap my head around it. Um, but, uh, and then you sort of mentioned it, but do you think, um, we'll get to a point soon where NFTs are also allowing, uh, you know, they're allowing people entry into like, let's say an amusement park or, you know, it like helps you to gain like if again, like say Disneyland or something, if they were selling NFTs, do you think we're going to get to a point where they could be something like you've got a fast pass in there so you can go to the shorter line or you can get new content from Disney before other people, or you can get a discount on your ticket to entry into Disneyland. Is that, is that kind of utility coming in your opinion? Many web two brands are considering NFTs as like marketing loyalty almost program. Mm -hmm. Like, oh yeah, you can you can do something uh with this NFT that gives you a discount and gives you a uh a community membership. Like if you if you would uh, go to like just in general latest marketing things in the traditional world, there will be a lot of talks about community because that's that's what's sticky. Whenever your friends are doing something and you have a real deep community, you 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 are now a loyal customer. Mm, I I am bullish on web on on digital and native use cases. It's it's always uh, hard to say oh um, there's cryptocurrency spiked and now there is Coinbase and everybody's buying crypto on Coinbase and then. PayPal saying, "Okay, we want we we want to use uh, we want to use crypto too," um, and and it, it adds the functionality to buy crypto, but people still go to Coinbase. Uh, yeah, there is this almost, uh, and people who go to Disneyland they would enjoy Disneyland without NFTs, but there is a new generation, younger generation that spends ninety percent of their time online, and those would be who will use NFTs to power truly digital, online first, virtual experiences that that are just new. It's not it's not that we were gonna apply an NFT to the previously existing experience to transform it. That's at least that's my view. Yeah, that's a good point. And and so you're saying don't try to frame it with what we know already because there are things coming that we don't we can't expect and that's what's probably going to be exciting for people yeah well alex uh this has been a really interesting conversation thank you for, for sharing um your, your past and your history with us uh, uh this is alex selenkoff he's the chief strategy officer at rarible um alex why don't you let folks know where they can find you online or and, and how they can uh, get involved with Rar Rarible? Uh, of course, rarible.com is the marketplace. You can create items there. You can create your own collections there. You can create your own marketplaces there, the Shopify type. So it's all things uh, creator. Uh, I'm me personally, Insider0x on Twitter and Salnikov dot lens on the new sovereign social media uh, where you're the owner of your content and you cannot be banned and stuff like that that's the latest thing i'm playing with all right i'll have to check that out and just to end with um is, am i being presumptuous to assume that you've made your million dollars by starting an exchange um not by exchange but I think like 20, 2017 bull run uh, just increased my general crypto holdings. So your bags, I, I was able to achieve my dream. Yeah. Okay. okay. Right on. Way to go. Um, well, I'm really glad to hear that. And uh, everyone check out Rarible. Um, they're, they're one of the be better. Uh, they've been really good on the um, fight for uh, royalties with, with artists and uh, you should definitely check them out. Uh, and again, Alex, thanks so much. It's been a really pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much, Matt. 
it's been a real pleasure talking to you. I love these deep conversations that we can get into the weeds and just casually chat about things. It's it's great. I love it. Yeah, I, lo I love it too. Thanks a lot, man. I'll talk to you soon. Well, hey, that's it for another episode of Decent People. Thanks so much for joining us. Make sure to hit that subscribe button. Check us out on the web at decentral.io. We're on Twitter at Decentral Media. Our shows are produced by Matt Solon. The music is courtesy of Brian Duncan and Kareem Imes. Thanks so much. Take care.